And showtime. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Channel Pro 5-Minute Roundup. Look at news, trends, and tips for the SMB channel in five minutes or thereabouts. My name is Rich Freeman. I am executive editor of the Channel Pro Network, also a co-host of this program. I am joined this week, as I am every week, by your other co-host, Eric Simpson, a business transformation and improvement advisor to MSPs and other IT providers. How's it going this week, Eric? It's going great, Rich. I'm uh, in Southern California today at home base, and you're in Northern California. So why don't you share with everybody where you are and what you're up to? So as far as anyone watching on video can tell, I'm, I'm in yet another generic hotel room, but actually I am in Palo Alto, California. I'm just about to attend the uh, HP Amplify Executive Forum. Um, this is sort of what they're doing in lieu of a full blown uh, partner event this year. It takes place tomorrow as uh, we record this and uh, I just got into town. Yeah, well, you look uh, you, you look fresh from from travel. So how long was the flight from uh, from your home base? Uh, you know, that Seattle to uh, the Bay Area, like 75 minutes, uh, smooth, easy flight. Weather's perfect here, Eric. I, uh, I, I was telling you off the air that I'm seeing the whole California dream right outside the hotel window here. I understand why you live where you do. Yeah, well, you know, there's always there's always some cons to the pros, but uh, we don't have time for that today, Rich. Let's get into the top story, shall we? <laughs> let's indeed. Let's let's do that. And so um, we're recording this uh, show a little bit earlier in the week than we normally do. It's been kind of a light news week, so I actually wanted to dedicate um, our time this week to a blog post uh, that went up just a few weeks ago. It was written by a gentleman named Abe Garber. Um, he is uh, he works at Focus Investment Bankers. Um, he is the head of their uh, MSP MNA desk, basically. So in the last two and a half years, he's done uh, or been involved in 47 different uh, merger and acquisition transactions involving MSPs. Uh, now, I remember speaking with uh, Abe back in March and asking what the MA landscape looked like for MSPs. He said it was going absolutely like gangbusters. That's like five and a half months ago uh, at this point, and a lot of things uh, have happened since then. I mean, first of all, uh, inflation has proved to be a lot more persistent than people uh, expected. Because of that, the Fed has raised interest rates um, significantly. Something like 70, 75 percent of economists out there are predicting a recession at some point in the next 18 months. Um, supply chain uh, uh, issues persist out there. So there are a lot of reasons to wonder um, if the, uh, the merger and acquisition uh, landscape for MSPs maybe has soured a little bit in that last five, six months. Um, as it happens, Abe wrote a blog post about this that we'll link to from the show notes if you want to look it up, and I do encourage people to read it. And uh, here's, here's sort of a money quote, uh, Eric. We are seeing no decrease in company valuations and an increase in the number of people wanting to have conversations with us about selling or buying an MSP. If anything, the market um, for MSPs right now is better than it was before, and, and the situation remains um, there is a lot of private equity money in particular chasing a relatively, relatively few number of high value targets out there. So there's sort of actually more money uh, than there is uh, than there are MSPs to buy with it. Um, uh, Abe is in regular touch with banks uh, that finance these kind of private equity deals. They've got plenty of capital. Um, they are not at all hesitant to loan uh, that money to, to finance these kinds uh, of acquisitions. Um, the interesting thing is all of those circumstances that I mentioned before that you would think might be a problem um, for uh, acquiring MSPs actually helps explain why uh, the market is still so good for them. So it, it, the businesses that are most exposed to current conditions uh, are consumer-facing businesses with dependencies on supply chains. Um, so if you are dealing with any kind of manufactured good, if you are selling to consumers, you know, the supply chain chain issues are going to be a problem. Um, the uh, in, um, inflation is going to be a problem. MSPs don't have these issues. They, they, this is business to business. It's a services business. There are no supply chain dependencies. 
And as we learned in 2020, um, IT services are essentially a recession-proof business these days because the, the last uh, contract that a small and mid-sized business is going to tear up is the one with the MSP because without that, they're out of business. So it's still looking pretty good um, out there for MSPs right now. Now, I, you know, the inevitable follow-up question to Abe when I discussed this with him um, earlier this week was um, how long does this last? What is your advice around timing for MSPs? And he said, if you are thinking of selling within the next five years, talk to an M&A advisor now, um, because it may take to, to uh, engineer any kind of transactions, probably going to take you a year, maybe more. And there may be a year, two years, three years worth of work that you need to do before you can really go out there and get the best price possible. So if you're looking at five years when you might want to um, trigger uh, an exit plan, now is the time to find yourself an M&A advisor and have that conversation about what your company is valued at today and what uh, you can do maybe to even increase that valuation down the road. Yeah, no, great advice from Abe. And <clears throat> as you know, Rich, I do work with a lot of partners on M&A uh, opportunities as well. I think I've been involved in over three dozen of them. And yes, the, the advice is if you're thinking about, you know, an exit strategy and you want to sell at the highest valuation, you absolutely positively should uh, work with someone that understands the drivers, the metrics and things like that. You know, a lot of the work that I do with partners, Rich, is helping them increase their efficiencies, right? Helping them maximize margins, helping them price and bundle services and adjust those deliverables according to what buyers are buying today. It is a completely different landscape uh, from a, an, uh, an SMB perspective in terms of what those buyers were investing in and what they were not willing to risk investing in before the pandemic as opposed to what they're investing in now. So there, we've talked about this on the program before, Rich, this you know, rush to you know, invest in more cybersecurity, that makes a lot of sense. Cloud migration and, and, and cloud workload migration and working more with cloud platforms certainly has you know, accelerated uh, compounding quarter over quarter throughout the pandemic. And of course now, you know, hybrid workforce support and optimization and management and things like that. So you know, bundling and, and adjusting and increasing efficiencies, preparing for maximizing your net profit. And we've talked about this as well. You know, that is the number one uh, metric that a buyer is going to look at is how profitable are you? And then we start unpacking, you know, things about the organization that make it attractive. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little um, curious as to Abe's timeline is forecast, Rich, because, you know, five years sounds like a long time, you know, in, in of course, an internet time in which, which we live in. And I know that a lot of partners are really at that, you know, at the upper end of, I think, the, you know, the, the age range where we start thinking about, hey, we want to retire, we want to sell our practices. And I think that's what's fueled a lot of this um, activity, this M&A activity. You know, I've been in the in the channel for, you know, let's call it 25, 30 years, right? And I know there are lots of MSPs that had practices and, you know, are at about that age or maybe even a little bit older than I am that are now looking, you know, in the immediate future, maybe the next 12, 18, 24 months. I'm working with several partners now that are looking to, you know, start having these conversations. So, you know, the best advice that I could give to add to what Abe said is, Look, if you want to maximize your valuation, no matter when the opportunity comes, because you may not know when that opportunity could strike, you could get a knock on the door tomorrow and someone could make you an offer that you may be tempted to take, but know that that is probably lower than what your potential or what your desire is. So start operating as efficiently as pro and profitably as possible. Insulate yourself from supply chain challenges uh, which is going to be a little bit of our tip of the week this week, Rich, uh, so that you can rely more on higher profit services uh, to maximize that growth and, and look to grow quarter over quarter. Start divesting yourself of, you know, um, those C customers, right, over time that aren't as quite as profitable, that won't sign your cybersecurity uh, agreement, right, to make sure that you're protecting them and they're, they're, you know, helping you do so more efficiently. If you've got clients that won't sign your cybersecurity 
uh, you know, additional services that you want them to sign in order to continue to provide service, then you need to replace those clients, right? With more profitable clients that are more strategic. But I'll stop there, Rich, and, and ask for your feedback. Well, I, you know, I think the the key thing, wh whatever the uh, the time frame is, and and you know, is uh, five years uh, beyond five. I think the key point is it is never too early, actually, to have that conversation with somebody who understands what buyers want and are willing to pay, because um, there is nothing sadder, um, basically, than, than any time I hear a story about somebody who thought they knew what their business was going to be worth and then discovered when they were ready to retire that they were wrong. Um, and now they, they're either not going to have the money they were planning to have in retirement or they can't retire until they do a whole bunch of work and get to where they want to go. So um, even if you're you're not maybe thinking about um, getting out within the next five years might not be a bad idea um, to have somebody who really knows um, what the acquirers out there are interested in take a look at your business with you and put you on a roadmap to get where you want to be when you want to get there now eric you hinted um, we, we talked a little bit about supply chain and the impact that that's had on the landscape there and uh, that very much has to do with your tip of the week absolutely so tips to uh, to help uh, overcome you know, the supply chain crisis or, or deal with it more effectively in your practice. So just three quick tips, Rich. I'm, and of course, uh, like all of my tips, they come from directly having conversations and working with existing partners right now. I brought on a brand new consulting uh, client. You know, they're a partner who has really, really been impacted uh, by the supply chain crisis. And that's, that means that projects that they had sold, uh, you know, during uh, the pandemic or even before the pandemic have ground to a halt because they cannot complete those projects. So forecasted revenues aren't materializing and they've had to do a lot of scrambling to overcome some of that, uh, uh, some of that revenue deficit. So just a couple of things that I wanted to share that we've been talking about with them. First of all, uh, if you're if you're heavily invested in reselling hardware and incorporating lots of hardware into your projects, my guidance would be to start adjusting away from that. Start, uh, you know, selling and looking for opportunities to sell more uh, services-based projects. Is there a way for you to deliver more services rather than hardware? And that would involve obviously diving into more cloud services, into more cybersecurity services, right? And remember, Rich, we know that uh, selling hardware, even on its best day, is, is gonna provide lower net profit or lower margins than selling highly valued strategic services, right? So, you know, start shifting in that direction. Number two, um, in your agreements, if you are selling projects that do include components of hardware where you feel more confident that you can deliver on these projects based upon what your uh, distributors and vendors are, are telling you is in stock and what they can supply, add some disclaimer language into those agreements. Add some disclaimer language into the uh, agreements that say things like, Hey, we're going to bill you on, you know, according to the schedule, uh, but there is a potential that we may be impacted by supply chain issues. We think we're okay, but should that happen, you know, we still need to uh, execute on the portions of the project that we can deliver pending the, uh, you know, the receipt of some of that hardware. So put yourself in the best position to continue to be able to invoice clients based on the things that you can deliver. And that leads into the third tip, Rich, is to phase your projects in such a way so that you can uh, deliver more of the service components of those projects, if possible, right, without the hardware, and allow you to uh, adjust your billing and invoicing based upon successful phase completion based on some of those services being delivered. Again, just trying to, to hedge uh, your risk around how you can address the needs of your clients, knowing that there is some supply chain uh, challenges and being very transparent with the client throughout the entire um, discussion 
so that they know that you're doing the best that you can, but we're going to deliver and phase these services in such a way so that you know we may reduce the negative impact potentially of having uh, a supply chain issue hit us. You know, it's not a perfect solution. We're all having to deal with it, but be, by thinking ahead and employing some of these strategies and being very candid and open with clients, rather than what we you know may sometimes find ourselves doing is trying to sell and close that opportunity to get the client to say yes without being very transparent and then having you know a more awkward difficult conversation later when you have to let the client know well you know what we can't get that equipment because you know we were told we could but not having that conversation earlier on can kind of bite us later yeah, three great pieces of advice, Eric, really. And so, I mean, first of all, we just heard, courtesy of Abe Garver, Garver that what the buyers are looking for out there are services businesses um, that are uh, relatively immune to supply chain issues. So, absolutely, if you are in the hardware business, that's fine, but you really need to be driving towards being a services-first company. Um, second of all, uh, some of the best advice I've ever been given is that 80% of success in business is managing expectations. Um, you take an order for hardware from a customer and don't set expectations about when that hardware will arrive, and it arrives later than they think it should, they're going to be unhappy, and so are you. So, I mean, telling them up front, you know, per your recommendation there, there are issues that might cause um, uh, this shipment to be delayed. You're setting expectations. They know what uh, could be coming down the road. They're not going to be uh, as, uh, as displeased with you um, if that happens. Um, and then um, the last piece of advice you provided um, echoes exactly um, some of what I heard. I, I attended a TD Cinex event earlier this year, um, and uh, this was an event that was heavy with uh, customers that do sell a lot of hardware. And they were in a situation where they were waiting for the stuff to come in so that they could uh, deliver it and get paid for it. And they were all getting very creative about doing the pieces of the project um, that they could do now and and phasing it out and getting paid in, in pieces and it i mean it, it works for everybody because the end user is getting some of what they want they don't have to wait for the whole thing to be available and you're you're getting paid you're not just kind of sitting out there with this uh expense hanging over your head waiting for the hardware to arrive so three great pieces uh, of advice for navigating uh, the the supply chain difficulties uh, that persist are Yep. And on that last point, you know, just I'll just, you know, chime in uh, and the, and and what you're invoicing for the service related things, you know, in those projects is going to be your highest profit billing. So it may not hurt as bad not having that hardware to resell at a lower margin. All right. Well, that leaves us with time for just one more story this week. It comes to us from uh, New York City, Manhattan, to be precise. We have yet another Interesting entry in the Guinness Book of World Records. Um, chefs Nick DiGiovanni and Lynn Davis decided to break the standing record for number of fast food restaurants visited in a 24-hour period. Um, how many would you guess they managed in, uh, 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 it was a single eight-mile walk, a 24-hour period. How about 69, Eric? 69 fast food restaurants. Now, what does it mean to visit 69 fast food restaurants in Manhattan in 24 hours? Um, the rules say you have to purchase and consume at least one food or drink item from each of those restaurants. Now, there is a loophole in the rules that says you can purchase food or drink um, and have somebody else consume it. So apparently in some of these places, the, the these folks bought something and then handed it free to somebody in line. Uh, they didn't actually eat something at 69 different restaurants, but um, still, they started out at 8.30 a.m. at the McDonald's in Times Square. Um, over the course of the day, they visited Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts, Taco Bell, Shake Shack, Burger King, Chick-fil-A, Wendy's, Chipotle, and Five Guys. And Eric, I get just a little queasy thinking about it. Yeah, I don't know if they had to consume something from each of those places. I doubt they would have, you know, they would have their their sixth stop might have been to the emergency room. I don't know. I'm just saying. So, huh. yeah, they gamed it pretty good. Right. So uh, 69 places in less than eight hours. I guess that just tells you how packed, you know, and congested an eight mile, you know, walk in New York City. Uh, you know, how, how many opportunities there are to to entertain yourself. And that's just eating. Think of everything else that's going on. 
Well, uh, thank, uh, thank you so much for joining us, folks. That is all the time we've got this week for you on the Five Minute Roundup. Eric and I are going to be back again next week with another episode. Um, for those of you who are unaware, we are both a video and a podcast these days, which means if you're watching the video but you also enjoy podcasts, you will find us wherever you get the rest of your podcasts. If that's Google or Apple or Stitcher or Spotify, you name it, you're going to find us there. Please uh, subscribe, rate, review. We very much appreciate it. Um, if you are listening to the podcast but you want to check us out on video easiest thing to do is go to the channel pro network channel on youtube there again you can subscribe if you click the little bell icon you'll get notified when the new episodes go up um, to get great business growth advice, news coverage for the industry, everything that uh, you need to be more successful on a daily basis, please visit ChannelProNetwork.com because we have got amazing new content for you every day there. To learn more about Eric and the work he does with his clients, you want to visit EricSimpson.com. That is E-R-I-C-K Simpson.com. So once again, we thank you very much for joining us. We are going to see you again next week. Until then, folks, please enjoy the rest of your week. Eric and I are enjoying the rest of your week already. already. <laughs>